I'd like you now to turn to uh, John chapter 4, please. Most of us know the story of the woman at the well, so I don't need to recount the whole story. We'll just start with uh, verse 19, where the woman now, having been asked to go and call her husband, which she admitted she didn't have, she had five husbands, Jesus told her, uh, she turns away from that subject pretty quickly and has a major question to ask Jesus about worship. Because the Samaritans believed that they had uh, a temple uh, and that uh, their worship in, uh, uh, in their, on their mountain was as acceptable as the Mount uh, Zion worship for the Israelites. So she said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. So she has somebody now who she believes can answer the question which she's obviously been struggling with for a very long time. She said, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and your people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So she knew of the temple in Jerusalem. She knew of all the festivals that would take place in the temple. She knew of their sacrifices. She knew of their singing and their, uh, and their glorifying of God in that temple. What she wanted to know was, uh, are they right? in their worship, or are we right in our worship? So he had the glad news for her, good news for her. <coughs> Everything is going to change. Jesus said to her, verse 21, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Think about that for a minute. You're not going to be worshipping in this mountain as Samaritans. They're not going to be worshipping in Je Jerusalem as Jews. The temple worship is no longer the focal point of worship to God. It's going to completely shift and it's going to be individual worship of God with hearts open to God, with songs of praise on our lips to God with obedience to the truth and here Jesus is explaining all this to her he says you worship what you do not know we worship what we know for salvation is of the Jews right now here and now the Jews are right you're wrong but an hour is coming and now is it's already present because Jesus is here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshippers. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The, the physical worship, the physical requirements of the Old Testament law and of the Old Testament worship were to pass away. There was going to be a new form of spiritual worship where we would worship God in spirit and in truth. When he says in spirit and in truth, we know that uh, to come in the right spirit before God is to come before his throne of grace in faith, with reverence and awe in our hearts and a desire to glorify God, to worship God, to serve God, to praise God, to honor God, to exalt God, to give God all that he is due because of who he is and because of the grace of God which we have received through Jesus Christ our Lord. But you see, the Jew also had to have a right heart in coming before God. This is not something new in that respect. 
For example, if we go to Proverbs chapter 21, have a look at Proverbs 21 now. And in verse 27, he says this, reminding the Jews. He says, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. When you come into the temple with your sacrifices, if you're leading a wicked life, which is inconsistent with the law of Moses, he says your sacrifice is an abomination before God. And then he goes on to say, how much more when he brings it with evil intent, when he brings it in order to honor himself, when he brings it to make people believe that he's more religious than he actually is, when he's looking for the approval of men, how much more wicked is it and unacceptable is it before God that a person would do that? We know from Leviticus chapter 10 when Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire before the Lord that they were struck down dead by God. Now they had obviously just been reasoning about this thing. Look, uh, I don't want to go all the way over to the tabernacle and take the coals from the, the altar of burnt offering, which is what they were required to do. We have a fire here. Let's just take the coals from here and make it easy on ourselves. They were thinking their own thoughts. They were going their own way and doing their own thing contrary to what God had asked them to do. This sort of worship is not acceptable worship. This is will worship, self-will worship. It has nothing to do with honoring God. It has everything to do with my convenience and honoring myself. They were struck down dead for it. To come before the Lord is to, to come into the presence of the almighty God who doesn't take any messing. He's not like another, he's not like a human being. He is perfect. He is holy in all his attributes. He is completely above us and beyond us. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. We need to bow in reverence before him. We need to understand the one we are trying to worship and we need to have the right attitude of heart in worshipping him. And so it was in the Old Testament. And that's the point he wants to make here. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord, we're told in Leviticus chapter 10 verse 2. And consumed them. And they died before the Lord. All the do-gooders of the present day would say, oh, that's terrible. How could God be so harsh? How could he be so cruel? Didn't even give them a chance. Struck them down immediately. What you don't understand, brethren, is that's what should happen every time we sin. Just because he called their bluff at this stage shows us that it's very odd occasion that he will suddenly allow his anger to pour out on us so that we might know who we're dealing with and who we're trying to worship. And it happened this time. And I tell you, there were repercussions within the congregation. And even with Moses, he was shaken, absolutely shaken to, the, to his boots or his sandals. Absolutely shaken. And it had to be explained to Aaron, whose sons they were, then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. Let's, let's, let's let that filter down into our minds and into our hearts. And every time we come before God, let us do it with the proper reverence and awe in the right spirit. 
Now, of course, even under the Old Testament, it had to be in truth. Psalm 119 talks about the truth of the Old Testament. In verse 142, he says, David says here in the Spirit, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law, and he's talking about the law of Moses, is truth. So they worshipped in spirit and in truth. So what, what I'm trying to get across here is, if they worshipped in spirit and in truth, What's different then? We've got to worship in spirit and truth as well. What's changed? Jesus is trying to get it across to this woman that there's going to be monumental changes. And the monumental changes are that the old order is going to be removed. The old covenant is going to be done away with. The worship of the Old Testament covenant is no longer going to exist. There will be a new covenant. And in that new covenant, the law will be written on the hearts of people rather than on the stones that the law was written on in the time of Moses. It's a new spiritual covenant. It's more, it more has to do with the inner man, but not exclusively. The outer man has to involve itself as well with what's going on. But basically, what's going on in the mind is what, what, uh, and in the spirit is what God is looking at and what is important to him. So when we come to services to worship God, what's going on in your mind and in your spirit is important to God. We, we in faith, have to place ourselves under this new covenant into heaven itself, before the throne of God Almighty, we in some way have got to work on getting that right and come with fear and trepidation before God Almighty and come with love and, and respect and a desire to honour and to glorify the Almighty. That's what we've got to do. But the truth, the context of the New Testament worship is the truth of the gospel. It is the teaching of Jesus Christ who is the Messiah. Just after verse 24, if you go back to John chapter 4, the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. She had that right. She had it absolutely right. And she wanted to, to say, well, it, if what you're saying is true, then the Messiah will tell us that that's right and show us the way. And Jesus answers her and said, I who speak to you am he. I am the Messiah. Listen to what I say. I will lead you into all the truth. I will declare to you the things of God and the requirements of God. Everything that you will do in spirit and in truth must be within the context of the new covenant. It must come from the Messiah. It must have his stamp of authority on it. Remember when Jesus told the apostles, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. But he said that after he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. There's no room for Moses' authority to override Jesus' authority. Christ's authority is a higher authority than ever Moses' authority was. Christ's law 
The law of spirit and lo of life in Christ Jesus is a higher, more spiritual law than the law of Moses. The law of Moses never brought forgiveness of sins. The covenant of Christ brings forgiveness of sins and a good conscience. It brings eternal life. A share in the life of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It brings a new form of worship. As we know, in the Old Testament, when they worshipped God, they sang and they played instruments. And this would just point up the differences. In the New Testament, every verse that speaks about music speaks about vocal music. And the scripture in the New Testament is completely silent about instrumental music. Just want to give you a taste of it. Let's go to Matthew 26, verse 30. After they had uh, had the Passover in the upper room and after Jesus had instituted the Lord's Supper, it says, uh, when they were finished, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, interestingly, and I'm sure you're interested, well, I am anyway, if you're not, what they sang here was a psalm. The psalms that were sung during the Passover are the Hillel, or the Hallel, H-A-L-L-E-L, which means praise. And it started with Psalm 113 and finished with Psalm 118. There's also Psalm 136 came into the picture as well in, in singing the uh, Psalms or the Hallel. So this was either Psalm 118 that they were singing or uh, Psalm 136. I'm not able to determine which one it was. I know it's one or the other. But they were singing a psalm, we're told, when they left the upper room. Now let's go to uh, the next passage of Scripture, um, Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Silas were imprisoned in Philippi. And verse 25 says, But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, I, I understand that this is not a worship service, but it was two individuals who sang God's praises. And it is recorded for us so that we might see, I'm sure, that in every circumstance, especially the dire circumstances that they were in, that in every circumstances, we can be joyous, we can be happy, we can sing songs of praises. And I know the early Christians, to counteract the influence of the entertainment world back then, where there was uh, music and instruments and all sorts of body songs were encouraged to sing the hymns, the psalms, the hymns and the spiritual songs together or on their own, outside of worship as well as inside of worship. So there should be times when we, we feel like we want to get together and just sing and be happy and joyous in the presence of the Lord and enjoy using those songs for that purpose. If we'll go now to, uh, let's say, Romans chapter 15. I'm just taking them in sequence here. Uh, 
And in verse 9 it says, And for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, Therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name, he says. Even though he's quoting an Old Testament passage, the emphasis is on singing to God's name. And of course that's what we should be doing. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it's an interesting chapter if you get a chance on your own to read this chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Um, first of all, let's look at verse 15. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the mind also, he says. Now, he's talking about the Spirit, the miraculous gifts. They were being used to teach psalms. They were being used in the singing. But he says, look, you need not only to sing with the Spirit, but you need to sing with the mind also. You need to understand what you're singing. And the lesson for us, of course, is when we're singing here, you have to be connected with the words. You have to know what you're singing. If you have finished a song and you realize, what, what did that song say? What thoughts did that present to my mind before God? You haven't uh, sung the song acceptably before God. You have to sing with the mind and sing with the spirit also. In verse 26 of the same chapter, he says, What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, and has an interpretation, that all things be done for edification, he says. What's happening then in the New Testament church is that the spiritual gifts were being used. They would, uh, is, some of them would be moved spiritually to uh, compose a psalm, uh, a, a, a hymn, a spiritual song. I don't think it's just confined to Psalms. It was a hymn, a spiritual song. And they would uh, teach it to the congregation and the congregation would sing it. Of course, there were other things involved. There was teaching, there was revelation, they were speaking in tongues with the interpretation. But all of what they were doing was to be done for edification, decently and in order and for the edification of the worshippers. All right, um, let's now go to Ephesians chapter um, 5 19. I know this may be a bit tedious for you, but these are all of the passages that speak about um, worshipping in song and with vocal music in the New Testament. And what you're seeing is there's not one mention. It is completely silent about instrumental music. And you'll see why that is so important when we come to looking at the Old Testament and what they were required to do. In verse 19, he says, uh, let's read from verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, a waste of money, a waste of time. Uh, it's just wasteful all round but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. So when he talks about singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, what were we singing? Psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, he says. And is it just coming from the lips? No, he says, make melody with your hearts to the Lord. It's, it comes from the heart. The, the joy of our salvation, the recognition of our forgiveness, the thought of Jesus loving us so much that we could be saved, that the Father sent him to save us from our sins and to redeem us from all the punishments that were due to us, should make us respond with voices uplifted, with thanksgiving in our hearts, to God Almighty, as we sing these songs of praises. In Colossians chapter 3.16, just as a matter of interest, the book of Ephesians and the book of Colossians 
have been called twin books. They were written at the same time when Paul was in prison. And many of the same subjects are covered. So when you're studying Ephesians, try and cross-reference to Colossians and see what way Colossians puts it because they become a commentary one Ephesians for Colossians and Colossians for Ephesians. So he talks about the same sort of singing here in Colossians 3.16. And here's the way he puts it here. I'm going to start with verse 15 because I think it gives us the whole context. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ, not of Moses, the word of Christ not of the Gnostics, not your own thoughts, not your own words. The word of Christ is to dwell in you richly. Where is the word of Christ? Where do you find it? I know you know the answer. It's found here. The words that are found in the New Testament are to richly dwell in our hearts. How, how can it richly dwell in the heart if it's like the seed that's sown by the road and just lies on the surface? It has to go down deep into the heart. You have to meditate on it. You have to try to understand it. You must grapple with it, wrestle with it as Jacob wrestled with the angel. You have to make it your own and part of who you are and what you are. That's the job. The whole flippant attitude of, yeah, I know that's what I must do. I knew it last week. I knew it the week before. I didn't take out my Bible the week before. I didn't take out my Bible last week. And again, I haven't taken out my Bible. Many of us don't even bring our Bibles to church anymore. The only reason we have them is because they're supplied out there. We're not used to having the Bible, opening the Bible, bringing the Bible with us. When I was a younger Christian, I had one of these small Bibles, pocket edition, it used to be in my front pocket, everywhere, everywhere. I'm just saying to you, that's the way it should be for us. We've got to bring it everywhere, like we bring God everywhere, like we bring Christ everywhere. We should be ready. When you go for a walk with a dog, bring your Bible with you. Whatever you're doing, be ready with the word of God on your lips. So we have, we have those two passages of scripture. And then we have Hebrews chapter 2. We're nearly, we're nearly there through the, the whole lot of this now. Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 12 now. I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. <clears throat> of course, it's talking about uh, Jesus proclaiming the Father's name to his brethren. And in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. We, we also want to uh, proclaim God's name to our brethren as we sing and as we proclaim uh, the greatness of God. And we also want to do it in the midst of the congregation where he is dutifully praised in song and in thanksgiving. So Hebrews 12, then Hebrews chapter, let's see, 13. And in verse 15, through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, he's explaining it, the fruit of lips that gives thanks to his name. That's what God wants us to do. It's what comes from the lips is the fruit. Fruit of what? The fruit of your, the spirit of God in you. The fruit of your study. The fruit of your devotion to God. The fruit of your love for him and for your fellow Christian. The fruits are there. And we're expressing them. And then, last of all, James chapter 5. And in verse 13. Is any among you suffering? 
then he must pray. Is any cheerful? He is to sing praises. Did you hear any mention whatsoever of an instrument in any of those scriptures? All right, now, here's how the instrumentalists try to get it into the worship of the New Testament church. You have to go back to Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 19. They say, watch this, it says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The word psalmist for psalms has, because it's an Old Testament word, it has the instrument is inherent in that word. Very clever. The instrument is inherent in that word. If we talk about baptism, is the instrument of that baptism, water, inherent in the word baptism? The actual word baptism means to dip, to plunge, to immerse, or to overwhelm. Does it say in what? No, it doesn't. You have to go to the different context to find out how you're overwhelmed, into what you're plunged. That's what you've got to do. We know from uh, Acts chapter 8, Philip and the eunuch, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? So now we know when we're talking about baptism, we're talking about water baptism. But what about... Jesus' statement, I have a baptism to undergo and I wish that it were accomplished. What baptism was that? It was the baptism of suffering. It was a baptism of suffering. And then you had the promise that was made of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A promise that was fulfilled to the Jews through the apostles on the day of Pentecost and to the Gentiles when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the household of Cornelius. It's not the same thing as this, the indwelling of the Spirit which we receive in baptism because Peter says, well, they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Who can refuse water for them to be baptized? So, water is not inherent in the word baptism no more than an instrument of music is inherent in the word psalm. The only way you would know if God wanted an instrument of music used with the psalm is because God tells you to use it. And so it was uh, and so it was in the Old Testament. But before we get to the Old Testament passages, let's, let's just check this idea of it again being inherent in, in the word psalm. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 21. In verse 16. And he said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read, Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise for yourself? This is Psalm 8. Have you never read Psalm 8? Okay. If you're reading Psalm 8, and instrumental music or instruments of music are inherent in psalms, then are you going to be singing and playing a harp while you're reading? Is that what is required of you, to read a psalm? 
We're saying it's inherent means it's, it's, cons it's part of its constitution. It's, it's a necessary characteristic of what the word is. That's what it is. So when you read a psalm, can you read a psalm? Or do you have to sing the psalm and play the instrument in order to be spoken of as reading a psalm? <clears throat> of course the answer to that is no. When David wrote the psalms, did he have to sing and play the harp while he was writing? A bit tough to do that. But it's, if, if it's inherent in the word, that's what he would have to do. It's not inherent in the word. You quote Psalms sometimes. Do you feel compelled to sing it while you're quoting and play an instrument while you're quoting the Psalms? Of course not. The whole idea of this instrument being inherent in the psalm is just nonsense. If, if that were so, Jesus and the apostles from Matthew chapter 26 verse 30 as we've just read sang a psalm. They had no right to just sing a psalm. A psalm inherently has an instrument of music in it. Who was playing the music? John? Peter? Bartholomew? So it's impossible to sing, read, write or quote a psalm without an instrument. How could an instrument inhere in the word, in the word psalm unless the context says so? And that's really the the crux of this matter, unless the context says so. Let's have a look at Psalm 71. This is the simplest explanation of this. I've got the right one here. Okay, verses 23 and 24. The first verse says, My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you. And my soul which you have redeemed, he says. Now that's not the one I'm looking for. That's not the one I'm looking for. Sorry? Oh yeah, all right, verse 22. I will also praise you with a harp, um, even your truth, oh my God. To you I will sing praises with the lyre. Um, so in one place he's telling them to play the instrument, and in another, the next verse he's telling them to sing. In other places he's telling them to sing, and in the very next verse he spells out they need to use an instrument. Now that's the way it is in the Old Testament. Every time the instrument was needed, it is spelled out in the Old Testament. I'm going to go through a few of these passages. I'll go back to Psalm 33 for a start. Verses 1 through 4. Sing for joy. In the Lord, O you righteous ones, praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy, he says. Look at Psalm 81 now. Now I have to be selective. There's lots and lots more of these uh, examples. Sing for joy to God our strength. Shout joyfully to the God of Jacob. Raise a song. Strike the timbrel, the sweet-sounding lyre with the harp. 
blow the trumpet at the new moon and at the full moon on our feast days. For it is a statute for Israel, an ordinance of God of Jacob. He established it for testimony in Joseph when he went through out the land of Egypt. I heard a language that I did not know. Psalm 98, verses 5 and 6. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Shout joyfully before the King of the Lord. Psalm 144, verse 9. I will sing a new song to you, O God. Upon a harp of ten strings I will sing praises to you. And then Psalm 150. Of course, it just tells everything to praise God. He says, verse 3, Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with trimble and dancing. Praise, praise him with stringed instruments and pipes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. That everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, all of this was done because they were commanded to use instruments of music in the Old Testament. Um, the command is given in 2 Chronicles 29, 20, verses 25 and 26. It was established through the prophets, through David, through the word of God, that they were to use instruments of music in their worship. Now you, you see the pattern. There's a pattern there of telling them to sing and telling them to play the instruments of music. Now you'd ask yourself, I better ask myself very quickly because the time is gone. You have to ask yourself, why did Paul not know the words for instruments of music? Well, he actually did. And he even wrote them in the New Testament. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Obviously, this is a subject I'll have to come back to now. I um, haven't got halfway through even. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Beginning with verse 6. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will it profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of knowledge or of prophecy or of teaching? Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? Oh, Paul, you do know there's such a thing as a harp and a flute. For if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? And then he goes on to apply it to, the, um, to speech that is understandable rather than speech which is, which is not understandable. So, so he does know. So the question is, would it not be, have been so easy for God, and I believe it would, to do what he did in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, if that's what he wanted to do. In one verse, tell us to sing, and in the very next verse, give us the instruments that we need to use to accompany that singing. And it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. That's the whole point. I'm going to have to close it here. Uh, I'll uh, come back to the subject next week. There's just so much interesting stuff. And I've been forced to do it because there was a man from America who wrote to me and uh, gave me lots of compliments about uh, our, our, um, our website and the, the preaching, the YouTube preaching. And he says he's used a lot of stuff from my lessons and everything. But he's obviously in the Christian church and he wanted to ha have a, a debate with me about um, a written debate about instrumental music. But that was about a year ago, and I was in no position to debate anybody else <laughs> other than the ones I was debating. So I said, I I'm, I'll, I'll get back to you when I'm finished uh, with other problems. So this is part of preparing to get back to him. But uh, that's why I'm presenting these lessons, just in case you want to know. But for the moment, Christ, the New Covenant, and the New Testament 
tell us to sing. It is a spiritual covenant uh, and the, the singing has got to be with the mind and with the understanding and it's got to be a spiritual part of a spiritual worship that is according to the spirit and the truth of the teaching of the Messiah, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's do that and that we will be fulfilling our duties. I'll leave it with you.